Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Frontline Club. Thank you for coming tonight. Um, tonight is slightly different to our normal events, as we will be starting the evening with a short performance, which will go on for about 25 minutes. Um, and I'll shortly hand you over to uh, Noah Berkstead Breen, who is the director of that performance. He can tell you a little bit about it. Um, but before I do that, if I can ask you to switch your phones to silent, and when it comes to questions during the panel discussion, if you can uh, wait for the microphone because we're broadcasting live this evening. So, Noah. Thank you. Um, so, I run Sputnik Theatre Company, which is a theatre company that sources and translates uh, contemporary Russian plays and stages them in this country for British audiences. Um, this is a little different to what we normally do, so we normally find plays and uh, translate them and put them on. Um, but I was asked to do a, a performance segment um, for this evening and wasn't aware of any plays on this subject about Khodorkovsky that exist in Russia. So I asked around a bit and um, found out about the prison diaries, uh, which seemed really fascinating material that I hadn't known about before. Um, so the most of what you'll hear in this performance in the next uh, 20 minutes um, comes are, th are three stories from the prison diaries. Um, I've interwoven those with a couple of interviews um, from various people. These are all word for word, um, nothing invented, um, real words uh, from uh, Khodorkovsky himself, uh, from his son from uh, Vasilya Alexanian, who um, some of you may know was a, a lawyer who worked for Khodorkovsky, and from one former prisoner um, who, um, let's say, knew, knew Khodorkovsky, you'll hear that story, um, and spoke out about it after he was uh, released from prison. And these parts will be played by uh, Jonathan McGuinness. I hope you enjoy it. Thank you. Reveille at 6 a.m., 10 minutes to get dressed, make your bed, shave, off to the toilet, and then breakfast in formation, porridge, off to work in formation. The law says that convicts must learn productive labour skills to help them after release. So, apparently, they assume I'm going to emigrate to China. Lunch for 10 to 15 minutes, porridge. 4.30, back to the barracks. I read and I write. 6 p.m. the march to supper. After that I read or meet with a lawyer. Lights out at 10. Well, when people ask me that question I have to think about it for a while. The only film that pops into my head is Come and See, an old movie that I couldn't even watch at the end nearly 30 years ago. It takes a while to remember what my favourite films really are. Wonderful pictures like Mel Gibson's The Passion. I can only sing if I've had large amounts to drink. That happened occasionally in my younger days. But I've wiped those nightmares from my memory. Yes, I did in 1987. It was a fight over my future wife. I'm not sure. Well, let's find out. One, two, three, four. Prisons people. Sergei. Sergei is well educated. He's been using drugs for a long time, but because he comes from a family of medical professionals and has a strong will, he abstains from using for several weeks at a time so he doesn't build up a tolerance. It was hard for him for several days when he came into my cell. But then it eased off and he told me his story. He bought from one dealer and the police <coughs> insisted that he tell them who his supplier was. He refused. So they set him up as a dealer himself. And they're going to give him 8 to 12 years. They slipped some mark bills onto him. Several days went by. All of a sudden, Sergei comes back from court. Clearly in a state of shock. They brought in a witness. 
the person who'd set him up. The witness was 50 years old. He too had been arrested in some unrelated case and he had a medical examination in the prison's hospital at which it was discovered that he had an incurable illness and was about to die. Stepping into the witness box, he announced, let them go ahead and kill me. I'm not afraid anymore. And then he goes on for about 40 minutes about his part in the setup, how he had been dealing drugs at the instructions of the police, how he would turn over the money to them, how they got rid of the competitors and the competitors' customers, People were crowding into the courtroom and the witness is pointing his finger at the investigators and saying, there they are, that's them, right there. Sergei's sentence was reduced to three years and he was released on parole. A week later, we said our goodbyes. He assured me that he would return to his job, a labourer on the railroad, and would quit doing junk. I wished him luck. Sixty-eight, sixty-nine, seventy. Yes, at my second trial, they claimed that we had stolen 218 million tons of oil. But how is that even possible? That's a question which none of the judges or prosecutors were able to explain. It's much more than all the rail tank wagons and storage capacities in Russia. The most oil I saw was at the reservoirs of the Transneft tank farm. If they'd been full, that would have been around 200,000 tons. But you can only see oil in the flesh, so to speak, during an accident. I've seen some 300 to 400 tons after a spill. It looks very bad indeed. The main problem is a bureaucracy that deems itself to be the highest estate. Whatever one's attitude to Vladimir Putin, and it, it would be hard to count me among his admirers, to ignore the fact that his being in power when speaking of the transformation of Russia, that would be absent-minded, to put it mildly. The opposition movement must negotiate with the Kremlin to reform Russia. Compromise is the sole alternative to force. <coughs> I was in the same cell as Khodorkovsky. We spoke to each other by writing on a notepad. He had a pencil and a rubber. He was worried that they'd record anything we said and that's how we communicate. That's how he communicates with his lawyer too. I was called in to see the administration. Two civilians came into the office. And they asked me to attack Kordakovsky when he was asleep. To stab his eye with a knife. They beat me up, but I refused. They called me back a second time. And they told me that if I didn't agree, they put me in solitary confinement and hang me. And say that I killed myself. So I, I nodded, as if agreeing to do it, and they gave me the knife. I don't know who they were because they were from the prison authorities. I was too scared to do it the first night, and they called me back in and shouted at me, Don't joke around with us! I decided to just give him a, a small scratch, and then the lawyers and journalists would come running. The next night, four in the morning, I went over to him, and I slashed his nose with a knife. I put the knife down on the windowsill and he was covered in blood. So I'm only speaking about it now because I'm waiting for my prison term to end. Yeah, I did stab another prisoner in the eye before Kordakovsky. But if you don't react to insult in prison, you have a difficult life. I don't regret it. I'm philosophical about it. What has been has been. Each person takes a lot of wrong steps in their life. Prisons people. Kolya. I happened to meet Kolya just as he was being released. He'd been doing time for a run-of-the-mill criminal offence drug possession. 
He'd already managed to spend five of his 23 years behind barbed wire. Half a year goes by and I meet Collier once again, only now with a grisly scar across his belly. He hesitates, but then he tells me a story that I later corroborated with other people who personally witnessed it. The investigators had decided to pin another case on Collier. We'll give you only two more years if you take the rap for a robbery. And you'll get a family visit and, uh, and the zone of your choice. Conversations like this are a regular occurrence and could be surprisingly forthright and candid. Collier didn't need to think long before agreeing. But when the time came for identi an identification lineup, they brought in a little old lady whom some lowlife had snatched a small purse from. The little old babushka, of course, didn't remember a thing and easily identified Collier as the person who had stolen her purse. Collier suddenly dug in his heels. I've never touched elderly people in my life, only people my own age. To take away the last crumb from an old woman? No, I didn't agree to sign up for that and I'm not going to, even if you kill me. Now the investigators rough him up a bit and then send Collier off into his cell to think it over. After a while, Collier knocks on the cell door from the inside. And when the guard opens the feed hole, intestines come flying out. Collier had opened up, as they call it in here. Full on harikari. The scar is as thick as a finger and extends halfway across his belly. And while the doctors are rushing over, the other prisoners in the cell tried to stuff Collier's entrails back in. He's permanently disabled now. But he has no regrets. I was here in the States when my father was arrested. I had a return ticket. But he told me through his lawyers that it wouldn't be a good idea to come back. I'm a technologist. I founded a company here in New York. Actually, I very much wanted to follow in my father's footsteps. But my hopes were rather cruelly dashed. This probably happened around 11th grade. My father and I had a talk and he explained to me that he didn't have any plans for passing on the business by inheritance within the family. Well, you'd have to know my father to understand that. And when he's choosing people to manage his organisations, he's always been guided solely by people's professional qualities. I'm speaking about this without any regret because actually I do love what I'm doing now. Until 2005, people in the USA had only a vague notion of who my father was. But in 2005, after the first verdict, the case began to resonate widely abroad. And when a new case opened up in 2007, people did start to react to my surname. I don't want to paint the situation in overly rosy colours here. There was negativity too at times. American academics who know the history of privatisation in Russia had a bad attitude towards the oligarch class from the start. But that's a rather not large group of people. Prisons people. Artyom. Artyom had worked as a civil engineer. He got a new job, a good position with a decent salary. For eight months, Everything was just fine. Then, the boss left on vacation while his deputy fell ill. Artyom was asked to take over for the boss for a couple of weeks. And it was at this point that he became aware that the materials for the construction hadn't been ordered. Alarmed, he began calling the boss on the phone. But he wasn't in. The deputy was also unreachable. He went to the police. They told him to get lost. After a while, the investors began to call. Not only had the firm's management disappeared without a trace, so had eight million dollars. <coughs> now that same guy at the police station who had refused to deal with his complaint now demanded a million. Otherwise, he promised to make sure that the buck stopped with Artyom. So, that's what happened. They gave Artyom eight years. Jail has taught me to sleep lightly. The gurgling sound in the toilet woke me instantly. I jumped up. 
lunged towards the door and yanked at it. And bad news. Attached to the heavy duty grill above the toilet is a rope made out of a tall bed sheet and hanging in it is Artyom. He climbed up on top of the toilet bowl and jumped. But the rope had stretched a little bit and the very tips of his toes were just barely touching the ground as the rope was bouncing up and down. I grabbed him, lifting him up with one arm while trying to pull the rope off with the other. You wouldn't think he'd be all that heavy, but I wasn't able to lift him at all. Grabbing him with both arms, I managed to lift him up a bit so he could breathe again, at which point I began to call for help, quietly, so that the guards wouldn't come running. The rest of the guys woke up and ran over, and together we pulled him out of the noose. We laid him down, pressed down on his chest, and he began to breathe, coughed, and then threw up. But in the morning, we gave him a scarf to wrap around his neck. But the guards noticed the ring-shaped bruise, and soon they summoned Artyom. The administration doesn't have any sympathy for suicides. They ruin the statistics. For a failed attempt, the dungeon and a sign, suicidal, on your chest, plus denial of early release on parole. Your Honour, I'd like to add a very few important points. <coughs> I beg your pardon. You're now seeing me via a television relay, apparently, in black and white. If you were to see me right now in the courtroom, you'd be horrified by my condition. On the 28th of December, 2006, they took me to the Prosecutor General's office, and the investigator offered me a deal. He said to me, We understand that you must have medical treatment. And he says to me, we must have your testimony, because we can't support those charges that we're making against Khodorkovsky and Lebdev. If you give evidence that suits the investigation, then we'll release you. But I can't frame innocent people. So they made the conditions of detention a lot worse for me. These are fascists, plain and simple. Please excuse me, Your Honour. 2007, I had a serious relapse. For three weeks, every day, I begged them to take me to a doctor, but instead they tormented me with hunger and with cold. I slept with my clothes on for a year. Two degrees Celsius, water running down the walls. This is the 21st century. What are you doing? Well, well not you, Your Honour, but the authorities. Since I've been held in detention, I've been diagnosed with another three serious diseases. When the European Court issued its indication to put me in hospital immediately, the investigator went on holiday. There is not a single lawful ground to hold me in detention. I ask the Supreme Court to show that there is justice in Russia that Russian citizens don't need to go dying on the steps of the European court in order to attain any justice. That it can be attained here, in Moscow, in your courtroom. I first met this man when he was a tall, thin, dark-haired lad about 15 years ago. He was 25 then. Not hard to recognize real talent. After a short while, he became the head of the legal team at my company, Yukos. He loved beautiful cars and beautiful women. He loved life in all its manifestations. When I was put in jail, he became my lawyer, and he fought, guessing, uh, not believing that everything had already been decided. He tried, with the same energy, an irrational energy, to save the company. His arrest on trumped-up charges became the price he had to pay for his belief in the law. He was ill at the time of his arrest, and over two years in jail his illness passed through all the stages until it became fatal. He was eventually released, 
blind and in poor health. She could have achieved a lot. May you rest in peace. Prison's people, Leosha. Leosha is a, an ordinary young fellow from a far off village with a broad, round face and black eyes that are constantly squinting. He doesn't remember his parents. He worked as a shepherd, tending the communal flock. And one day he came across a thief stealing a sheep. Leosha threw a rock at him and hit his head. But the thief turned out to be a robust man and quickly came too. Leosha panicked and did something that could not be undone. He hit him with the rock again and again and again. He understood his situation and he ran away. He was caught by chance several months later, a thousand kilometers from home. He got a six and a half year sentence. I met him in the sewing workshop. He was a hard working fellow, not talkative, inconspicuous. After some time, the prison, is, uh, the prison administration issued me a reprimand because I'd given a pack of cigarettes to a cellmate, which they called illegal alienation of subjects in favour of other convicts. And I filed suit against the administration. Now, unexpectedly, I found out that they had intended to call Leosha as a witness against me. They called Leosha to, to the stand. And he's obviously confused and scared, but he tells the truth. He says that the investigator gave him two packs of cigarettes and told him to say that he'd got them from me. And then he hands the judge a pack of L&Ms, admitting that he smoked the second pack, pack, adding that I've never had cigarettes like this before. The investigator is sitting in the courtroom, his face slowly turning purple. There is a stunned silence. Finally, the chairman of the court pronounces, everything in this trial is on record. If anything happens with this fellow, I'll make sure the record goes public. After the trial, I approach Leosha. Why on earth did you do that? I ask. You know perfectly well that you'll get into trouble. You haven't done anything bad to me, he says. I couldn't do it. And he walks away. I asked to be informed promptly if someone attempted to beat up the usher. The reply was, and who's going to have the guts to do that? The administration is afraid and the prisoners respect him now. If I'd known everything then that they were going to storm my plane, arrest me, and everything which happened next, the two court cases, ten years in prison, my children growing up without me, I'm afraid I'd probably have shot myself. There's been a lot that I am proud of, and lots that I am ashamed of. The main thing is that I've not lived an empty life. So I'm Edward Lucas, I'm the international editor of The Economist, and we're going to talk for about uh, half an hour among ourselves while you sharpen your questions, then you're going to fire your questions at us and we'll fire some answers back and we'll try and end punctually at um, 8.30. Um, I don't think the panel needs much introduction, but I'll just for the sake of it say how pleased I am to see Tony Brenton, who as the British ambassador to Moscow was at the sharp end of the very thuggish behaviour of the Nashi um, uh, episodes uh, when he was 
constantly pestered with demands to apologise, which he never did, so he hadn't done anything wrong. Um, we've got uh, Ben Judah, um, friend and colleague and author of this fantastic, oh, fantastic book here, which is available from all good bookshops on Amazon or Kindle, and of a forthcoming e-book. And Tonya, Tonya Samsonova, who's come to London as a foreign correspondent for uh, Echo Moskvi and for TV Rain, and is investigating Russian corruption, which I think is enough for an encyclopedia, let alone a book. And this is, of course, sadly, the place where your inquiry should start. So I think we'll, we'll kick off with a, a round of um, opening thoughts from the, um, from the panel before we get into discussion. But, Tony, do you think that the um, way that the Russians' regime realised what it was getting into when it started taking down Holocausty. Did they see this as a strategic thing or as a tactical thing? And if they, knowing what they know now, do you think they would have done anything differently or is this pretty much what they want? I think, I don't think they're very comfortable with, with where they are. Um, Khodorkovsky did set himself up in rather clear opposition to what the Putin regime was up to, particularly with regard to pipelines to the Far East. And he did breach Putin's insistence that the oligarchs could hang, hang on to their money uh, provided they didn't get involved in, in politics. And he was misguided enough, in effect, to accuse Putin personally of corruption on primetime television. So what finally happened, in a sense, wasn't a surprise. Um, that said, I, don't, I think the Russian authorities saw this man as a, as a political opponent, a very dangerous political opponent, actually, who had to be removed. <coughs> but they saw this as being a rather straightforward operation because, of course, there is very little Russian public sympathy for oligarchs, and they didn't think really at all about the repercussions internationally, in a sense rightly. I mean, they saw this as very much a domestic matter, but because of the, it, it can only be described as the, the, the acute mishandling of both trials, that they were so blatantly fixed, because of Khodorkovsky's huge talents at projecting his plight, and I have to say, I, thought, I mean, I was very impressed by the performance we've just seen. Thank you very much. It's a reminder that some things in Russia don't change because, of course, prison literature in Russia goes back to Dostoevsky, goes back to Chekhov. And here you have a repetition of the appalling conditions, the fixed uh, confessions, all of that, exactly as happened 100, 200 years ago. And I, and I think people, you know, this was, here was this oligarch who was being locked up, so what? But this turned quite rapidly into a personal tragedy and into a very compelling indictment of the Russian justice system, which, to my mind, remains valid. Ben, you kick off your book, I think, with an extraordinary account of a, of a kind of judicial raid against a uh, hapless and uh, a bunch of, bunch of victims. And it's a theme of your book and of your writing, of this sort of lawlessness. And there's a kind of paradox in this, because what Putin would argue, and Putin's supporters would argue, is that he's brought stability to Russia. And by locking up the oligarchs and dealing with all the loose ends of the Yeltsin, Yeltsin years, he has basically calmed things down, um, maybe also stitched them up. Um, but this is um, a stability that the Russians welcome. But the, the, the theme of your reporting is actually this isn't really stability. It's a kind of endemic low-level or even not so low-level lawlessness. Well, the, kind of the sad reality of the, the Putin projects, that Putin kind of triumphed a politician, but he can fail to build a modern state. And as you travel through Russia, what you see is that Putin's project of putting power back in the hands of governors and police officials, law to only, only to him, orders they would receive by telephone. The other side of this deal was that they could become predatory on Russian business and on the emerging middle class that would appear. Khodorkovsky sees himself as the first victim of this process, and he's very successfully sold himself as that to Russia. But I thought I'd just kind of start with a few kind of points to kind of guide our conversation this evening. And it's been 10 years almost since Holocaust was in jail. It, 10 years is a long time to be in prison, 10 years is a long time in Russia, and it's long enough for a lot of myths to appear. And over the past few years, we've seen a mythology of Holocaust emerge, especially in the West. I think the first myth is that this was a, a battle between Putin and Khodorkovsky over, over freedom. I think this wasn't quite the case. It was a battle over oil. I think there are two important statistics in, a, in an oil-based economy. The first statistic is the price of oil. The other statistic is what percentage of 
that the profits on oil are taken in tax by the state. In the 1990s, under Yeltsin, this tax cut had been reduced to under, under 50%, around 30 35%. And Khodorkovsky and the other oligarchs who controlled 90% of Russian oil at the time were doing absolutely everything they could to make sure that that tax take stayed there. This was in 2003. The Americans had just invaded Iraq. There was certainty that oil prices were going to boom within the industry. And Putin and Khodorkovsky found themselves in this battle over oil taxation. Putin was trying to increase the oil tax rate through the Duma and found himself consistently blocked by MPs that were on the payroll of Khodorkovsky, parties from the Communist Party to the Union of Right Forces, which was the kind of liberal, liberal party that was also on the payroll of Khodorkovsky. Khodorkovsky was managing democracy to stop the, this increase in taxation. And Putin decided to resolve the issue by arresting him and by destroying, uh, destroying his company. Needless to say, afterwards, the tax on all profits in Russia are now 83%. And the result has been is that that one trillion that Russia has made since 2003 in all profits, it belongs to the state and it doesn't belong to the oligarchs. So that was what it was at stake 10 years ago. It was a battle over who would own the oil boom. Who was going to become rich on oil at $120 a barrel? A, a series of hypergarchs, completely unmoored from the state, or the Russian state? That's an interesting point that the, one, one could imagine a situation in which the oligarchs, companies of the 1990s, were all nationalised and were run like Saudi Aramco. Now, many countries have state-owned oil companies and were run in the interest of the state. And of course, that didn't happen. That the um, although the taxation went up, the companies, the, the main assets of UCOS went to a company, which I'd hesitate to name in this <laughs> era of libel lawyers, um, but run by, by people who have been at least accused of being Putin's cronies. But, um, but Tony, so, uh, Tony, I want to come to you next. T tell us how Russian thinking about Khodorkovsky has evolved, because my impression at the, at the time when he first got into trouble was that Russians thought that he and everybody like him jolly well belonged in jail, it was the best place for them, and if the um, trial involved a few um, cut corners and shortcuts and so on, this was probably not a bad thing, but I get the impression that over time he's kind of almost like a character in a great Russian novel, he sort of redeemed himself in the eyes of Russians through his suffering in jail, that he's not getting special conditions, he's having a very tough time. So how, how has Russian thinking about Khodorkovsky changed over the last 10 years? Well, traditionally, you can't find a lot of sympathy to a rich person in prison in Russia, and you can't appeal for that kind of, of sympathy to a general public. But the funny thing is that uh, my colleague, ben, my friend, Ben Judah's point <laughs> is that, uh, look, uh, the fight pr uh, with Putin and Khodorkovsky was not about the democracy in Russia, but about the oil. So then you would say, OK, they were fighting about the oil, so no need to put your sympathy to Khodorkovsky. And this is exactly what Kremlin propaganda would try to persuade the general public. Look, he's one of the oligarchs and he just lose his business game. But the output of this, of this uh, completely, uh, of course, of course, uh, tragedy of, of Khodorkovsky was not a tragedy of his own. But his case opened a path of the similar small cases in Russia and only in five or six years, <clears throat> general public started to understand what actually happened and about what actually lawyers of Khodorkovsky would, would tell and continue to tell the people for many, many years. The thing was that this pattern of taking out somebody's company to, to your interests through the court, through the so-called justice, uh, happened to multiply itself in a small, small uh, occasions and a lot of entrepreneurs, very small one, happened to be to be in prison. And the case was exactly the same as Khodorkovsky case, but on a sm smaller scale. And the first thing that happened is that by nine, by 2009 and 2010, we started to realize that so many entrepreneurs were were in prison, were in camps because somebody just wanted their business because they they were profitable enough. And the only reason, uh, and, the, and you would be in a risk group if only your, ki your type of business could be easily, um, could be easily 
taken of you if it's not if it's your intellectual property if you are producing some some expertise then it's no sense to take your business out of you but if you have something visible then it makes sense for investigators for judges for somebody to take a business out of you for prosecuting you and for putting you for prison and this is exactly what happened to Hodorkovsky so by by 2010 we started to see these outcomes. And a group of former uh, business editors and a group of the members of the families of those entrepreneurs who were illegally imprisoned, like Harakovsky was, started to form, uh, to organize their group. And, started, and their voice started, started to be clear. But in two years after the, 2010, the other thing happened. We actually received some more political prisoners, people who were detained and arrested because of their political views. And that started actually with the Pussy Riot case, I would say, was the first really loud and international process, uh, which was uh, absolutely political. And because of those political prisoners and entrepreneurs who are more privileged than previous prisoners, I would say, 600,000 uh, people right now in Russia are imprisoned, and 30% of them are imprisoned in the prisons where, where they have to work. The, they have to work, that means that they can't choose. They want to work, and they want to go and, 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 and do something for 12 hours during the day, or don't want to do this. It's not their choice. They have no salary, or, or literally a salary of one pound a day, so they're like, Chinese working force, but much more convenient for Russian companies. So the thing that happened, and the thing that we, we had a chance to knew several months ago because of Nadezhda Tolakonikov from Pusa Riot, is that this, the late Soviet prisons and the late Soviet system of, I'm sorry, in slavery, the prisoners, for work, working for the state uh, and produce some profit, uh, just just never, never changed since then. For 20 years, we didn't pay any attention to this. And now we know that those absolutely enslaved people in prisons work, but not for the state uh, profit, but the, for the profit of officials of the prison system who would become millionaires, and one of them, who is the ex-member of the parliament, just bought uh, several flats in Miami, and Nadezhda Tlakonikova from Pussy Riot, she receives one pound a day, working 12 hours a day, just to ensure that this person would have this flag. Moreover, this person has business representatives and business partners who have businesses in this country. Um, just with an eye on uh, friends from the London libel firms, I should just say that we're not making imputing any possible wrongdoing and anyone, everybody involved vehemently denies them um, any, any, any wrongdoing and the Frontline Club is not endorsing um, anything that's being um, said here. Is that okay? Ed, Ed, can I, can yeah, I, go and turn it. Sorry, just to come back to a point that Ben made, which I'm afraid I don't entirely share. I don't think the Khodorkovsky affair was about money. It was about power. What this was, was Putin removing a political opponent. The money actually came afterwards and certainly there were very large quantities of it. But the action against Khodorkovsky fell precisely in the earlier actions that were taken against Berezovsky and against Gusinsky, and indeed against the later action, which is still slightly underway against Navalny. This is m the money. I mean, lots of people creamed off a lot as a result of what was done to Khodorkovsky, but fundamentally, it was about power. And just it was, a, it just was also to answer that, yeah, please. Um, I, I don't disagree. I think we're just kind of talking past each other. Is what I'm just going to qualify that and take that further. Pro between 2000 and 2003 in Russia, you had various patronage networks. The Kremlin wasn't the only source of money, the only source of corruption, the only source of, of the only distributor of rents. Right up until 2003, different oligarchs, on a very small scale, but especially Hodorkovsky, had their own networks. Hodorkovsky was an alternative to Putin. You could go for him to find funding for your newspaper, for your network of NGOs, networks of schools. If you were a political party, you could go to Hodorkovsky. So what happened? in 2003, which is why it's about power, but it's also about money, is the destruction of all competing patronage networks and the establishment of one vertically integrated system of patronage and thus corruption in Russia. 
But it's, and I think you're, as in many cases, events have multiple causes and multiple meanings. And it seems to me you're right, it was, it coincided with the, the state's kind of grab of oil revenues, and it coincided also with the um, elimination of opposition. And I think it did a third thing, which uh, Tony just referred to, which is it, it kind of, I can't say legitimised, it wasn't, wasn't legitimate, but it sort of entre so it entrenched a way of dealing with people. Yep. And, and I, I agree there were precedents in the way that Berezovsky was treated and Kuczynski was treated and others, but I think this went into kind of overdrive with, um, with, with, with Hodakovsky and started an era of lawlessness towards these other entrepreneurs, which is, um, which is, which is going to this day. But I, I was wondering, do you, do you feel that this sense of uh, fear and outrage about the way that corrupt officials can use legal means to steal property from, from, that they want and to put people in jail who resist them. Is this having a political effect? Is this something that is the basis for, a, for, for political dissatisfaction with Putin? Or is it just seen as a bad feature of life in Russia like the, the weather and the roads and other sort of things that just, you know, shit that happens? It's absolutely uh, the weather on the roads. Uh, because every time you participate in something, you calculate your risks. You calculate your risks when you go to the public meeting. You calculate your, and there was, I was, uh, there were a lot of me, public, a, a lot of political demonstrations during the winter between 2011 and 2012, until the the May of 2012. I was pregnant, uh, and I was a journalist, so I have to go to the meetings. And I always check with my husband whether it's okay or not to, to go there. And once he, he, he started calling me and he started telling me, look, today is a very, very dangerous day. Just please leave everything and run. I don't know how he did it, but somehow he predicted that in this very moment, in that exactly cafe, some guys from the uh, Amon, which is like a special police force, came and would destroy everything. In two days I would ask him, how, how did you realize that this would happen? And he said, look, it's just, it's just on the end of your fingers. You, you don't know why the weather would, why it would be raining today. But from your, uh, from your experience, from your experience of living 25 years in this country, you can easily predict such kind of things. And, um, that kind of fear, uh, when you're in a group of danger, or even in a group of risk, when you're an entrepreneur, when you're a journalist, when you're dealing with some kind of uh, po politics, or not dealing with politics at all, but you have a nice car, or you park your car in some, some you don't know. There is lots and lots and lots of situations. But imagine yourself uh, living in a country when your risks are, 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 uh, are raising every year and every month. And the, the another thing is that if you would be catched for some, from for something, uh, like I would say in spring, but that means you would be held in detention for five months, and then the court would start, and you would be and the justice would be in five in five months post the the, the, the day you were catched, and the situation this part, five months could change completely. From the milled democracy, from the restricted democracy, your country in half a year could become um, some sort of authoritarian regime. So when you calculated your risks in spring, you didn't pay attention that you would be prosecuted in, in, the, <coughs> next, uh, in the next autumn in the another country, which could be just just another country. And when Kumi Naidu, or the head of the Greenpeace International, told me that, you know, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't prepared that my activists would be, det would be detained and would be arrested, because the year before, uh, the, the, coast, the coast people from the coast, uh, coast they, yes, they would just say, okay, have a nice trip to Norway. So I would say, <laughs> why, would they, why would they charge us with piracy in a year? He was completely wrong because in one year, so many things could happen to Russia. No. Tony, I want to ask you about where the West fits into this because the initial reaction was fairly cautious when Hodakovsky was arrested. The West was, in those days, was not um, perhaps as hostile to Putin as in some respects it is now. If you look at the way in which this 
the, this looted money was laundered through, for example, Western stock exchanges, and the co complicity of so many Western um, financial and other institutions in all this. Do you feel a, a certain sense of, 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 of disgust, um, or do you think? I mean, and, and do you think that there's any kind of leverage here for putting pressure on the um, the Putin stealing machine and making life more difficult for its representatives when they come abroad? At the risk of making myself the most unpopular person in this room, no, I don't feel any disgust. I'm afraid. I mean, there is genuinely dirty money out there, and I mean, I've seen the insight from, from the inside a bit. We do actually work quite hard at identifying those flows and controlling them. The money that basically resulted from the, the nationalization of UCOS and the people who made money from that, okay, the processes in our terms were, uh, what's the word I'm looking for here? Fraudulent. Well, I, immoral, immoral. <laughs> but in, in Russian legal terms, they were legal. And we run a competitive, a, a, a financial system which is in competition with a number of other financial systems around the world. And if the money doesn't come here, it goes somewhere else. So I think it is right that we act against drug money, money that comes from blatant illegality. But on the issues like uh, the, uh, the nationalization of UCOS and the profits that flowed from them, I'm afraid I'm persuaded that I'm more concerned about the, the, the benefit to the UK because otherwise the money would just go somewhere else. Ben, do you want to come in on that or anything else? Uh, I would like to come, into that, uh, come in on that. But if, you're a, if you spend a lot of time in Moscow and you spend your time rushing between the different opposition cafes and bars and hangouts and going to see opposition leaders and you introduce yourself as British, you just get treated like from a pirate nation, you know, a country of which there's no point having a discussion about what should Britain do about human rights, what should Britain do about Russia, what should Europe do about Russia, as long as it's extremely easy to plunder money in Russia, to loot money from the Russian budget, to loot money from the Russian state, meet a lovely gentleman in Moscow or in London in a lovely cafe, and then this man will help you put the cash into Britain's empire, an empire of tax havens over, over which the sun never sets, where Britain is making its so-called wealth from. I'm not entirely convinced that this money benefits the British economy in a way that we would like it to be growing. I'm not entirely convinced it's the kind of hot money that we want coming in, driving up house prices by 10% in, in a month. I'm not sure what jobs it's creating, but what I know is it's destroying the credibility that people like Margaret Thatcher, people like uh, Clement Attlee spent 50 years trying to build up in Russia, which is a Britain, Britain and the West as champions of human rights society that's worth emulating. I, I'm not sure how deeply you want to go into this. The, 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 the tax havens point is a separate one. The issue of money going to the Cayman Islands and all of that. And actually, I'm, I'm no longer involved with this, but actually uh, the government has gras grasped that nettle precisely because they want the taxes to come here. So it has become much harder to salt away ill-gotten gains in, in a tax haven than was the case two or three years ago. The issue about the money coming here, going into the houses, going into other parts of our economy, I was certainly never, treated, never regarded as a pirate as I spoke to potential investors in the UK from Russia as I did so. And I can assure you that as I dealt with those people, there was money coming in to create British jobs. And that matters. It's, uh, of course human rights matter. Yes. Um, well, now, let, let me finish. Let, yeah, me, sure. let me finish thought, on, on my, my, my emotional upbeat. Of course human rights matter. And I think my personal record is a fair demonstration of my commitment to them. Of course. But I am just com as committed to the work opportunities of my wife's relatives in Liverpool, for example, where Deripaska set up a car factory. Um, there are lots of poor people around this country, people who've lost their jobs, who, as a result of Russian money, have a better chance of getting a job. And that matters too. Um, Navalny was in London the other day. I think Ben and I were both there, and he was actually not the other day, the other year, I think. Yes. But, 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 he, he, he said something very interesting, which is that, so I said, what he, he said, there's a new anti-Westernism in the Russian opposition where we regard, uh, the, the people I talked to, he said, regard you in the West as accomplices with Putin in the, looting, in the looting of Russia. And if we come to power, when we come to power, um, we're going to be under a lot of pressure to settle accounts with you guys because of what you've done. But 
Tony, does, how, how, does, how does this argument sound to you? Is this an argument that would make sense in the context of a cafe, maybe a nice cafe in Moscow, or even a nasty cafe in Perm or somewhere, Mukhransk or somewhere? Um, what, 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 would, um, what, what, what would you... Um... I've got a very nice cafe. Okay. <laughs> uh, if this meeting happened to, happened to be three months before when I just arrived to London, I would talk to you about the the disaster conditions in which Russian prisoners are held. Because I would think that somebody in Great Britain could help those people because we are helpless. We are helpless in fighting for hundreds and thousands of political prisoners back in Russia. But then after several discussions with my friend Ben, I realized that actually, well, the conditions of Russian prisoners is not an electional question in Great Britain. But what is an electional question in Great Britain is an investment from Russia that came to London and the well-being of the, of the British citizens. And I would ask, well, Ben, but what if some people who put their money into your economy are as cruel as you can't imagine, as you can't read in Shakespeare's books, as, as cruel as... as I don't know what, and 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 you and and they enjoy shopping in in the best uh, in the best shops in uh, in London, and maybe they are under Interpol uh, list and they're still going around the streets in London. Why isn't it uh, an electional question? He would say, well, money is more important than these moral things, and that's the reason why I wouldn't I wouldn't tell you that the actual conditions of political prisoners are much, much harder than you, you have just have chance to, to see in this <coughs> marvelous play. And that Khodorkovsky actually, while he has to work every day, his conditions are not the same as Tlakonikova conditions uh, or as another prisoners who can simply die and then, then they would be, they would, uh, on, their, on their sentence there would be written suicide but they were, they, 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 they were dying because of the, of the hard, hard work, they would say. And probably you haven't, haven't seen, saw the film. I know it's, it's, it's actually it's quite boring to explain and to, and, to, and to describe these conditions. And to be honest, I was, I was, I was a radio presenter at, for six years in Moscow running well, quite a popular morning show and an evening show. And if somebody would mention to me in 2009 that I should talk about the prison conditions, I would say, well, boring. Why should anyone <laughs> be listening to this? It's a horrible story. <clears throat> but now, now when, when some of my friends uh, could simply the next week or next year join the very same conditions, and anybody could, well, I think it's, it's probably too late to, to think about this. <coughs> And, uh, well, the other thing is that probably you think that the judges in Moscow and in Russia are very cruel people who would decide so many, people, so many people's fate. But actually the judges are probably the same kind of prisoners of the system because they don't decide anything now. Uh, the system, the law, the, 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 uh, the judicial system is actually ruined because 99% uh, of the decisions of the court are against the prisoners. And that means that if you would say Kremlin decides about, upon this exact case, that means that Kremlin could only decide whether he's not guilty. And to, to call somebody in Kirov, as they called for Navalny's uh, judge, or to somebody in Murmansk, as they called, uh, to say, not guilty, please write the sentence, not guilty. But because Kremlin absolutely convinced, uh, absolutely know, as we know, that 99% of, of the sentences would, would, would be guilty. So when Putin says, I don't want to intervene in this case, that means, actually, I would translate to you, that means I know that, that they would be guilty and I don't want to do anything with this. Thanks. I think I, it's I'm sorry, and with, uh, it was only once with Khodorkovsky when it was not the same. Because with Khodorkovsky, Putin would call and say, he is guilty, please decide that he is guilty. And afterward, it was the first signal, and afterwards, every court and every judge in Russia would understand that if no, if no call was received, then it means guilty. 
And if somebody would call, then it means not guilty. So Khodorkovsky case was the starting case to all the other cases, mm -hmm. unjustified cases in Russia. I'm going to bring Ben in a moment. I just want to say, if anyone here follows China, Harry Wu exposed the Lao Gai system, the colossal system of secretive slave labor camps in China, which make Russia look like Switzerland. It's far, far worse. And um, the, the lack of interest in Western governments in following this up was um, uh, stunning and shameful. Uh, ben? I, just, I thought it would be useful for the discussion to provide some context about Briefly, Russian, about Russian money and the kind of money that's coming in Russia and coming to this country. So, you know, Russia is an emerging economy. Russia does have an emerging middle class. The only difference from other emerging economies is that this emerging middle class is being extorted by the state. It's not being extorted by the state in a giant planned operation from the top. What's happened is that ever since 2001, 2002, moving through the Khodorkovsky case, Putin destroyed every institution of accountability in Russia, from newspapers to par parliaments, regional and national, whilst elevating bureaucrats to become untouchable, making them all members of his party, making them the new honorific class of the state. The result was these bureaucrats saw the boom that was happening in Russia, only partly driven by rising oil prices. They wanted increasingly a piece of it. So what's happened is two stampedes out of Russia. You have a stampede of good, clean Russian money, small entrepreneurs coming to live in this country, followed quickly by the people who are, who are their, their very predators stealing money from them. Right. Um, I think it's time to go for questions from the floor. Um, just to get you in the mood, hands up everyone here who is from Russia. Hands up everyone here who's been to prison. <laughs> hands up to be to prison. And ha I was going to say hands up anyone who's been to prison in Russia. So <laughs> I, was, I was jailed by the um, KGB a couple of times. Um, yeah. Not Russia. So jailed you... or detained? Detained. Well, detained. I've been detained, detained as well. Okay, right, yeah. uh, you can't be honourable political uh, leader of the opposition in Russia if, you're not, if you haven't ever been in jail. You just can't be, you can't build your reputation. And you right. can't, nobody will trust you if you have never been in jail. Super. Well, on that, on that happy note, let's start looking for some, some questions. If you could identify yourself, not necessarily by your um, criminal record, but just by your, <laughs> some other identifier. That, go ahead, you first. Okay, Elena Durdensmith, uh, producer and whatever. Friend. Friend. And friend of this country. Who, I do respect, and I do love Margaret Thatcher, as a matter of fact, and Her Majesty Queen. You are happy people to have monarchy. Look what happened to my country when the best was killed. Anyway, I was interrogated as a young student in 1968, Czechoslovakia story. When at uh, the lecture I said, uh, the professor read us, professor of Moscow University read us a letter from uh, our sort of how we call it, sister university from Czechoslovakia, saying, how dare they to write a letter like that? Our friends support us, we are in trouble. And I uh, and my friends during the lunch, lunch time, I said, they're absolutely right, we should do something. And it was immediately, <coughs> ta, ta 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 KGB. And uh, it's a long time story, and thanks to my father, Somehow, otherwise I would be in. Uh, but I spent several hours. And then they suggested me to cooperate with KGB. I said, let me think. And I came home, talked to my father. Uh, my father was a very smart person. And he made it. So it was, I had troubles for a few years at university after that. But I remember the person who talked to me. And it was scary. And I think it's completely entirely the same. And Khodorkovsky's story is my story. I was producer of two films on him for BBC, Russian Godfathers, and Khodorkovsky with Kirill Tushi. And I just want to say to you, I'm, I'm, we, we never met, that it, uh, both tri uh, trials I watched, I was there. Mm -hmm. It was completely, entirely injustice, humiliation. And nobody ever persuaded, I was there, you were not. It was absolutely nothing to do with law. He was not judged by law. Okay. That's what I wanted to say for a long time. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, and for sharing your memories of those days of 68. Um, now, we have two questions. We have these two gentlemen here in the front. Go ahead. Hello, I'm, I'm Oliver Bullough. I'm a 
a journalist as well. I have a, an a, author, plug your book. An author, no less, um, and a journalist. I have a question for Mr. Brenton, actually. Sir. Um, sir. I'm sorry. Um, <clears throat> it's all right, I answered. I, I, mean, I answered to Tony, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean I'm, I'm delighted to hear, obviously, that, that, that the uh, British tax haven issue, issue is being cleared up. And also that... I don't um, think I quite said that. And also, <laughs> also that Mr. Darapaska is investing in Liverpool, which obviously is lovely. Um, just a question. Of a, a, a man who obtained some aluminium smelters investing in this country isn't... Do you, are you convinced that that's good for this country? Do you not worry that maybe the money isn't entirely washed clean when it crosses the border and perhaps it doesn't just bring jobs with it but possibly brings some of the business practices that obtain the aluminium smelters in the first place with it. Do you, do you not worry that possibly the pipe isn't only bringing money and is also bringing other things? Do you want me to answer that straight yes, off? Yes, go ahead. That's a direct question. I, 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 I'm conscious that I've, I've said something uncomfortable for, for a lot of people here. Not at all. But the reality of what the British government's job is, is to look after the prosperity of the British people. No. <laughs> Sorry, <I'm... laughs> and obviously you have con consideration for not encouraging bad practices overseas but the best thing you can do to protect the British people from bad business practices is have effective legal controls here which I think on the whole we do um, if we, we take money not only from Russia we take it from Nigeria we take it from no doubt highly criminal elements in the United States the fact is that we have an international financial, we run an international financial centre which takes money, unless it is irretrievably and visibly soiled, <coughs> from all over the world. And the operation of that financial centre helps to make the world richer, as well as this country. Now you, as I say, you control the extremely unacceptable, but otherwise you have to rely on countries themselves to impose the sorts of controls that they choose to impose. And I, I mean, with regard to Russia, it's a very interesting, interesting debate to be had about Russia because I have raised, I did at the time that I was there and subsequently, the Russians have a real problem with capital outflow. Why don't they impose controls on it? And the answer comes back that actually they judge it as better from the point of view of the Russian economy. And we all have an interest in the growth of the Russian economy to allow Russian money to flow overseas and find investment opportunities overseas. This is all a long way from the human rights arguments, but it's important in terms of the prospects for, as I say, looking after this country's interests. But finally, I think the only thing, one of the few things that is guaranteed to make Russia a better place is making Russia a richer place. Right. I, I, so I'm going to have very brief interventions from Tonya and Ben, and I'm not going to let this turn into a um, let's beat up Tony Brenton session. So um, I think we've, we've pretty much explored that particular angle. We should move on to other things in the question. Um, Tony first, then, then, then Ben. Have you ever considered this scenario if the future government of Russia would become the opposition government of Russia, opposition to President Putin, and they would find out that all the money invested in British economy was invested illegally, and they would ask British economy to return the money? Is that likely to your opinion, opinion to happen or not at all? It can't happen. I mean, the money is invested by private people. The Russian government no doubt would very much like to put pressure on certain Russian citizens to repatriate their, um, their funds. But the reason the money has been sent abroad is to avoid what would happen to it in Russia. That means so, that even the, if the money are illegal, this is completely safe strategy to Great Britain. Well, it's, not, it's not a strategy. We run an open economy where we take non, as I say, non very visibly tainted money wherever it comes from and allow it to be invested um, okay. profitably for the sure. people concerned. Okay, enough. Ben, I'm going to cut you off that. But all <coughs> other questions. Ewan, go ahead. Yeah. Um, th thank you very much indeed. Um, Ewan Grant, um, former intelligence analyst in UK customs for the ex-Soviet countries. Um, I could say th something about Sir Anthony's point. But, but you're it, not going to. Well, I'm sorry. not, yes. no. Um, <laughs> my, I, I, I live in uh, West Moscow otherwise known as West Astana, otherwise known as Muswell Hill. And my question is to all the panel, um, my sources in Russia have told me that there was a lot of attention in the media to the recent death of Tom Clancy, 
who of course covered Russia in many of his books. In all the books he wrote in his peak, he used to use two phrases, one of which was, why didn't the dog bark? I would like to ask the panel which questions the panel feel we should be asking about Russia and Western relations with Russia that perhaps aren't being asked and maybe even getting into conspiracy theories um, why they're not. Okay, that, that's a great question, you and we'll let the panel ponder that. I was it so good and take some more. Lady in the front, yes, go ahead. Sorry, Melissa, I'm doing it. It's Kinko Kobas, journalist from Japan. Uh, thank you very much for your presentations. You rather very much scared me about uh, Russia, but my question is that, that <laughs> oh. but if we should be a little worried about money from Russia, how about the uh, media? Because Mr. Revedov, he's uh, another Russian uh, family um, who, <coughs> is, uh, who holds a um, two, couple of newspapers. What do you think we should evaluate him? Uh, we'll get on to Mr. Lebedev in a moment as well as the questions that we should be asking. Aunt, let's take the gentleman at the back there with his hand up. My name is Richard Fort. I work for a scientific charity. It's a question about the future. I think we've already had part of the answer to this, uh, but what does the future hold? How can things possibly improve in Russia? Okay, that will um, come more questions in a moment, and we're going to go from left to right on what does the future hold? Should we worry about Mr. Um, Lebedev? And what is the question that we should be asking? It's a bit, it's a bit difficult, you know, because at least... I mean, Tony, well, we can do one each. Yeah, well, we, we, I mean, we are all... We're, we're journalists, so we should really be asking these questions anyway. But, um, Tony, if you could write... What, what, if you, what questions you what, what, the audience? Yeah. Well, can, I, can I just answer two of the questions? On um, Russia's future, strangely enough, I'm an optimist, actually. <laughs> The country has done very well over the last 10 years. It's now running into, into potential economic difficulties, which are going to make the, the rather oppressive style of governance that they've gotten used to much more difficult to run. Because to get economic growth, they're going to have to do something about their legal system, something about the corruption, something about the redeastfer, which is, has become a, a sort of standard practice in uh, the state battening on, 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 on private individuals. And there's, there's a, there's a a substantial, a growing middle class who are concerned about corruption, by no means a majority, but there's the makings there of real pressure on the Russian government to slightly improve things. It's not going to happen quickly, they're not going to give away power uh, <coughs> voluntarily, but they already, they already know, and we saw this in the, in the context of the Nav Navalny affair, we've just up and down the roads, the traffic lights work. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I go in, I talk to lawyers, I talk to people who will do, I talk to accountants, Business functions, okay, there's a rough edge, but business functions to a substantial extent in a way that I can understand and engage with and put money into. And I think Russia gets a far, as I say, I repeat, there's lots wrong in Russia, uh, but Russia gets a far worse press in this country and has a far worse reputation than actually it deserves. And Ed himself, great man, made the comparison with China. China, people are flooding into with their in um, personal rights terms, is in a much, much worse condition than Russia is. ...on international capital markets, which would see Russia's international debt spiral. It's obviously happening in, a, in an, atmosphere of glo uh, an atmosphere of debt internationally being an issue. So I think that's a big worry for me. But for the moment, they don't have any international debt. Yes, they pay to... Oh, can we just have a quick answer on... Li well, politeness is just the etiquette and the protocol. Well, you should do this. Uh, the thing is that you would probably should ask you, uh, yourself a question. If everything in Moscow is so beautiful... Yes. Are we being too hard on Russia? Or not hard enough? Actually, I don't know why you should pay any attention to Russia. I mean, I mean there are so many countries in the world with the, where people are, uh, are living in even worse conditions. And, you know, with the, with the semi-democratic, with the low authoritarian regimes, it's always hard, because if Putin... Uh, they, in fact, uh, marketed, because the Harvard uh, economists failed terribly in creating the middle class, uh, they sold off the privatization um, by just reaping all of the, the private um, stock. I'm in Brunel University, and I specialize in EU external relations. 
So one of the themes that uh, has been running through this discussion is the reaction of the West, whatever that means, whether it is too tough or it's not tough enough. Um, my question is, um, what is the West, first of all, if it is only UK or it's maybe European Union or also the United States? And I think, because I, I suspect he's going to be out next August. Um, I, I think we're, we're, we're the, the, in the closing phases of the Khodorkovsky saga. But the calculation, which I'm pretty sure is going on in the Kremlin now, is, is he going to be more damaging to us out than in? In, they are aware that they have a real presentational image problem. Out, he's undoubtedly going to become a major campaigner against and critic of the Russian regime, but an oligarch. And therefore, will have less traction with the Russian people uh, than uh, another person would be. I mean, that's on a Holocaust, but it's a very interesting moment coming up. And one test of the way Russia is going will be, this is a European country which ended communism under its own volition. There are a whole bunch of other European countries which ended communism under, under their own volition and became members of the EU, respectable members of the international community. Russia has faltered on the way, and we kind of expected Russia to rise to European standards and still hope that that will happen. And that's quite an important emotional component to what Ed writes, I suspect. If, when you travel around Russia and you go to the, the depths of Russia, you go to these sad, sorry towns, the, pr the propaganda of Putin has worked in a sense. People believe their country is being robbed by these mysterious forces. But it's broken down because people think that the people robbing them are not the oligarchs of propaganda, but it's the officials who've become oligarchs. The propaganda's become confused. Right? And Tony, a final word or words for, for, for you. Wrap, wrap up as broadly as you like. Well, ten, ten years is, is a long time, and, and it's enough time to forget about any political personality you want. And it's even a uh, very long time for Russia, who, uh, because in, in our country we're, we forget about anyone in, in such a quick time. Like yesterday, we have a terroristic attack on Vladivostok. No, we don't want to, to talk about this because it happened yesterday. And, 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 and you know, and compared to these 10 years, it's, it's, it's like forever. And, uh, you know, all the journalists and all the opinion leaders right now in Russia, they're, they're in the middle of their 20s. So they were 15 or 16 when Khodorkovsky was arrested. So obviously, he wasn't their hero. And their hero now is, is Navalny, who could easily not so good era as it was even with the late Putin because a lot of crises are about to come an economical crisis the uh, the political crisis or uh, with the migrants and the ra uh, ra racist riots in Russia and all so many things could collapse easily and probably Putin would would try to escape Russia before it would collapse during his during his authority so the new government would come and the new government would face a complete disaster. So the following years would be released in six months. Well, thanks so much. I do apologize to the people who tried to ask questions and I didn't have time for. We are out of time. I would urge you to continue the discussion downstairs in the um, bar or the restaurant or, or wherever. And I'm sure we'll be back here at the Frontline Club before too long talking about Russia. Again, um, I'd like to, I'm not going to try and summarise the um, discussion, I just want to thank the um, participants for their 